What a beautiful day it is here in Rockaway, and I greet you in the name of the beautiful Savior who makes the world new again, the beautiful Savior who conquered sin and death, who rose victorious from the grave and gives us all the promise of life everlasting. Amen and amen. Uh, I'd like to start, as you know, I'd like to start many of my sermons with a question and I particularly enjoy trivia questions. You've discovered that already. I love trivia. So I have a question for you to think about. Here's your question of the day. What is the first word Jesus said to his disciples after he rose from the dead? I'll repeat that. What is the first word Jesus said to his disciples after he rose from the dead? Anybody want to venture a guess? You just said it, right? Did you say peace? Thank you. Jay Decker, you win the door prize. You get to take home a lily after church today. How's that? Yes, the answer is peace. That's the first word Jesus said. Imagine he comes back from the dead. He didn't say boo, or he didn't say hey, or he didn't say hallelujah. No, he says peace. Then he added a few other words with that. The words that appear on your monitor today, peace be with you. What a beautiful greeting coming from a guy who just rose from the dead. And what does that say? It says that Jesus places a tremendously high value on whether we have peace in ourselves, peace among our relationships with one another, peace in the world. Peace is very, very important for Jesus. Because notice, the first word was peace, not even love. He said, love one another before he died. But then when he rose from the dead, he said, peace be with you. That's important. Now, picture this for a moment. He, he rises from the dead. The first thing he says is, peace be with you. And what did the disciples do? They argue and argue and quarrel and quarrel and fight and fight. That's all they ever did. It's ironic that Jesus blesses them with a word of peace and those first century disciples, all they did was argue and disagree. They argued over where to preach the word of God. They argued over uh, what Christian communities should be started and where they should be started. They argued over whether new converts should first learn Jewish rules and Jewish traditions before they could become new Christians. They argued over how to worship they argued over communion and what it means and what it doesn't mean. It's so ironic that these guys, all they did was argue and fight after hearing the words, peace be with you. Very ironic. That's why I want to address this today. I believe that healthy relationships must begin with peace. This is part two of my seven-part sermon series called Delicate Relationships. And peace is a critical item in any relationship, whether it be a relationship with your spouse, a relationship with your neighbor, a relationship with someone you work with, peace is important. It's the critical element. And so here's another question I have for you today. Why is it so difficult to keep the peace in our different relationships today? That's the question. Why is it difficult? And on your monitor, I came up with five reasons I believe it's difficult to keep peace in your relationships. Number one is we have trouble keeping peace because we get upset over trivial things. We often get upset over things that really don't make a difference, but we get upset anyway. Years ago, I witnessed a congregation where they were constantly fighting with, with each other. You know what they were fighting about? They were fighting about which hymns to sing on Sunday morning. They fought and fought and fought. Turned out the younger people wanted to sing newer hymns. The older people wanted to sing the old chestnuts, the, tradi the traditional hymns. All they did was fight back and forth, back and forth. This went on for a long time. Finally, they came up with a compromise solution. They said, all right, let's do this. Let's have two different worship services. And when one worship service, we'll sing all the newer hymns that were written. 
And by new, I'm talking about hymns that were written less than 500 years ago. <laughs> and then the other crowd said, oh, great, we can have our own worship service where we can have our traditional hymns that we all know and love since when we were children and when Martin Luther was a child or whatever. Okay, so that's fine. You think the issue would be resolved? No. What do you think they fought about then? They fought about what time each worship service was to begin. And they fought and they fought and they fought. It just went on and on. Reminds me of a story of a congregation, not this one, but the, a congregation that was also arguing about which hymns to sing. So the pastor stood up one day and the pastor said, let's do this. Whoever gives the largest amount of money today gets to select three hymns. Well, sure enough, some lady, some old lady in the back of the church, she raises her hand and she pledges this enormously large sum of money, clearly the winner of the contest. And the pastor said, congratulations, now you can select three hymns. And she said, okay, I'll have him and him and him. I hope and pray that's not a true story. <laughs> But why do we have trouble keeping the peace? Because, well, we get uptight about little things sometimes. And number two, we hold grudges. Do you ever feel yourself holding a grudge? Did anybody ever insult you and then you just keep thinking about it? You're just replaying the video in your mind. You're thinking, how dare she say that? Or how dare he say that? And you just can't let it go. You know, we hold grudges. It can go on for years like that, years. Most of you are familiar with the, the old Andy Griffith show. Remember Andy Griffith years ago? All right, I'll spare you the rest. Thank you. Somebody was, was it you, Kurt? Oh, you're blaming her. Okay, yeah. You never notice you can't whistle when you're laughing. It, it just, you know, I can't finish. So anyway, the Andy Griffith Show, turns out there are two farmers uh, in adjacent farms that they hate each other. They, they hate each other. They're not getting along. And one is Amos, the other is Obadiah. And they just hate each other. So finally, Andy, Sheriff Andy decides he's going to be the mediator. He's going to keep the peace. He's going to try and get these guys to finally bury the hatchet and let bygones be bygones. So he sits down on a park bench and he goes, Amos, Obadiah, why are you guys always mad at each, at each other? And they said, well, this goes back for generations. Our fathers hated each other. Our grandfathers hated each other. Our great-grandfathers hated each other. And Andy said, okay, so what, what are the problems? What are the issues? What, what, are you, what are you so mad about? Amos looked at Obadiah. Obadiah looked at Amos. Gee, Andy, we don't even know why we're mad at each other. You see, it was the Hatfields and the McCoys. It just kept going on and on, generation after generation. These guys didn't even know why they hated each other. This is the problem. When grudges last, they can last a lifetime. They can last from generation to generation. Why do we do that? Why don't we work toward peaceful resolutions, peaceful solutions? But we hold grudges, and that interferes with our ability to keep the peace. Then there's number three. Why do we have trouble making peace, number three? Because we often make mountains out of molehills. Mountains out of molehills. There was a woman who woke up one morning. First thing in the morning, she gives her husband the cold shoulder. She doesn't look at him. She doesn't talk to him. He, he asks her a question. She turns the other way. The complete silent treatment. This went on all day. And the husband went up to the wife and said, why the silent treatment? Why, why am I getting the cold shoulder? And her answer was, because last night I had a dream that you were cheating on me and I'm still trying to get over it. That's a true story. That was my mother-in-law. That's a true story. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Why do we have trouble keeping the peace? Number four, we insist on being right. That's a problem when you're trying to keep the peace. Did you ever hang out with a know-it-all? Yeah, somebody who knows everything. 
Somebody who wants you to know they know everything. Somebody who corrects you every five minutes. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about or you're not saying that correctly. And nobody appreciates a know-it-all. And that can hold deep-seated anger and resentment after a while. This, this young couple that the husband was saying to his wife, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Next day, I know more than you do. You don't know what you're talking about. Finally, she convinced him to go to marriage counseling because she was sick of living with Mr. Know-it-all. They go to marriage counseling, and after they describe their issues, the counselor looked the husband right in the eye, and the counselor said, so tell me something. Do you want to be right or do you want to be married? That hit home. Who says you have to be right all the time? And you know what? Even if you are correct in certain issues, can you let it go once in a while? Can you just let it go for the sake of the peace? Well, let's look at number five. Another reason we have trouble making the peace is we insist on having things our own way. I'm sure you know people like that. People who basically say to you, it's my way or the highway. It's going to be the way I say it's going to be. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I'm the one that makes the decisions. My way or the highway. Well, you know what? That doesn't help in any relationships. None whatsoever. This is biblically based. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 13. That's the famous passage we often read at wedding ceremonies. It's, you know, love is patient, love is kind, and all that. You know what he says later on? Paul says, love does not insist on its own way. Isn't that interesting? That even Paul was outlining the ingredients of healthy, loving relationships. And he says, if you want to be in a healthy relationship, don't insist on having your own way over and over and over again. So what are we to do? We learned about the barriers for peaceful relationships. What can we do now to maintain peace? If you look at the monitor, the number one thing is obviously compromising. You can't always get what you want unless you're a Rolling Stones fan and you like that song. But you can't always get what you want. You need to compromise. You need to find common ground. Give a little, take a little, give and take. All relationships are better off if there's give and take, if there's common ground somewhere in the middle. Number two, what can we do to keep the peace? Take the high road. Don't lower yourself to the level of the person who is insulting you. We all know what that feels like sometimes. Did you ever get an email that is directed toward you and it's an angry email? It's just a snarky email. There's a personal attack. Somebody is, is, is just jabbing at you. That's an email. Do you realize that you are under no obligation to answer that email? You don't have to do that. Those are called flaming emails. When people flame you with vitriol and anger, there's no rule that you have to volley it back. You want to. There have been times in my life when people send me this nasty, angry email and I start welling up inside and I'm thinking, I'll give you a piece of my mind. I'll let you have it. And you know what? That doesn't do any good whatsoever. You just let it go. Don't lower yourself to their level. Don't wrestle in the mud when they want you to wrestle in the mud. Take the high road. Don't volley back. This is biblically accurate because in the Bible, St. Paul says, do not repay evil for evil. That's simple. You don't volley it back. You turn the other cheek, you let it go. And then you can keep the peace. Number three, how else can we keep the peace? Well, simply placing things in their proper perspective. Not long ago, there was a best-selling book published called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Did anybody read that book? It's fantastic. Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. In fact, not only was it a New York Times best-selling book, but they came out with various sequels from the book as well. The point is clear. Read the first page. Often in life, you shouldn't be worried about stupid little things. 
It's always the stupid little things that get under your skin, the stupid little things that cause you to, to, to mull over this and, until finally it festers and boils and you're not the person you want to be. They're basically saying, don't get uptight over little things. Ask yourself this question. A year from now, is this really going to make a difference in my life? Or two years from now, is this going to make a difference in my life? True story. My father and his sister had a disagreement a long time ago. They allowed the disagreement to boil and fester and fester and keep on going. Nobody said, I'm sorry. Nobody said, let's bury the hatchet. Nobody said, let's have bygones be bygones. They went 40 years without speaking to each other, my father and his sister. And each one of them went to their graves without reconciling. This is not what Jesus wants. Because Jesus said, right as soon as he rose from the dead, his very first words were, peace be with you. These are the words from your Savior. Work at it. Pray for it. Try to be the peacemaker. Be the representative of Jesus Christ that he's calling you to be. You be the peacemaker. You be the one that's not holding, holding the grudges. You may not always agree. You may not always agree with the person who is opposite you. You may feel attacked by that other person. But that doesn't mean you have the right to volley back. Just let it go. Be the peacemaker. Work at this. Psychologists call this de-escalation. De-escalation. That means if somebody attacks you or they're insulting you, you want to raise the ante. You want to volley right back. But something inside of you says, what good is that going to do if I shout right back at that other person? What difference is that really going to make? Can I be an adult and walk away from that? Can I let an evil, vitriolic person ruin my life? Am I going to let that person dominate my thinking? No, you let it go. But best of all, you become the ambassador for peace that Jesus is asking you to be. He wants you to re represent him in the world. He wants you to be the peacemaker. He wants you to share the words of grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation with other people. He wants you to be the living, breathing example of the gospel. So today I conclude my message today with four of the most important words spoken by Jesus as soon as he rose from the dead. Those four words, peace be with you. May you have peace inside of you. May you have peace in your relationships at home, at school, at work. May the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you always. And to that I say, amen. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.